Welcome to this talk on public-private partnerships. What I would like to discuss with you today is first, what are public-private partnerships? What are we talking about? What are their potential advantages and their specificities compared to private contracts? So, first of all, I should say that public-private partnerships are very fashionable. There is not one week without any newspaper article talking about PPPs. For example, if you look at the Financial Times, you will find more than 800 articles on this topic since 1990. If there are a lot of newspaper articles as well as a lot of academic articles on PPPs, it is difficult to give a clear definition of what they are. What are PPPs? Let me give you a simple definition that is now widely accepted. PPPs are contractual agreements between local authorities, local public authorities at the national or local level, and operator, public or private firms, in order to invest in public infrastructures and to provide public services associated with the infrastructure. So usually when we are talking about PPPs, we are talking about global contracts, agreements that are bundling together investments and service providing. Think of a water network, a highway, a new school building. You ask a private company to deliver the infrastructures and to provide some kinds of services around this infrastructure. That said, we can distinguish two major kinds of PPPs. On the one hand, you've got PPPs for which the operational risk, especially the demand risk, is transferred to the operator. It means users are paying for the service. If there is no user, there is no revenue for the operator, and this is what we call the French concession type of PPPs. This is absolutely not new. The first concession contracts in France has been signed several centuries ago. For example, the Pont Neuf in Paris has been rebuilt through a concession contract at the beginning of the 17th century. This type of PPPs is also the most developed, especially in less developed countries. If you look at the World Bank data, especially the PPI data set, the Private Participation in Infrastructures data set, investment projects financed through PPPs in less developed countries represented more than $100 billion in 2014, essentially through concession contracts. On the other hand, you've got another type of PPP that started at the beginning of the 90s in the UK and that spread all over Europe since then. Agreements in which this is not the user, but the public authority that is paying the operator, depending on his ability to reach performance targets. So when we are talking about those kinds of PPPs, we are usually talking about PFI contracts or availability scheme contracts. Contracts in which the operational risk is not transferred anymore to the private company. Of course, in reality, you might see PPP contracts that are a mix of both PFI and concession contracts, but the common characteristics is the same. PPPs are global contracts. So what is important to remind is that sometimes the public authority has a choice of the type of PPPs. Think of a museum or a stadium. Sometimes it is more complicated. Think of a prison, a school. It is impossible for the operator that is investing in the infrastructures and that is providing some kind of services to be paid directly by end users. We are talking a lot about PPPs, but why? Is it only because of the shortage of public money? or is it because of their potential advantages? This question is very similar to the make or buy issue. Public authorities have the choice to make by themselves, that is to say to provide the services through direct public management, or to buy through PPPs. One obvious advantage of PPPs is that they permit the public authorities to benefit from expertise and experience coming from private firms. In addition, they permit to benefit from scale economies compared to the direct public management solution because operators usually have several clients and they operate on large scale. So the public authority through PPPs can focus on its monitoring task or its regulation task and is not obliged to be involved in the production for which she has no uh, competitive advantage. But one of the main advantages identified in the economic literature is coming from the fact that PPPs are uh, contracts that are bundling the construction, the construction stage and the execution stage. Because the operator that is investing is also the one that will operate and provide the service, 
the operator has huge incentives to minimize the whole cost of the project and not only the cost of one stage. It means that the operator might overinvest in order to reduce the operational cost of the project. It is well illustrated in the famous article of Oliver Hart in 2003. What are the disadvantages of PPPs? One obvious disadvantage is that they are long-term incomplete contracts with potential high transaction costs that may arise at the, bidding, at the bidding stage. You might think of aggressive bidding, collusion issues, corruption issues, winner's curse issue. At the execution stage, you might have some renegotiations or opportunistic behavior coming from both sides. And at the renewal stage, this is well described in details in the other talk concerning the franchise bidding solution. Contract theories, and especially transaction cost theory, are giving insight concerning the way to craft contracts as efficient as possible. So by the end, the economic literature is considering for a large part that in PPPs, this is partnership that is the main issue. PPPs are long-term incomplete contracts, and it is important for their success that both parties invest in the relationship in order to minimize as much as possible transaction cost. It must be a true partnership. And very often, the literature considers that there is no difference between private and public contracts. However, recent developments suggest that useful ingredients for the success of private contracts are not working so well for public ones. In other words, in PPPs, public is also important because public contracts are intrinsically different from private ones. This is the third-party opportunism view that has been developed uh, by Pablo Spiller's work. This is quite easy, and this is a quite simple idea. If I quote Pablo Spiller in his 2008 paper, he said that a fundamental difference between private and public contracts is that public contracts are in the public sphere, and thus, also politics is normally not necessary to understand private contracting, it becomes fundamental to understanding public contracting. So what is stressed by Pablo Spiller's work is that public contracts are characterized by the fact that you've got a substantial amount of supervision and control that is done by third parties. You can think of political contesters or interest group, consumers group, consumer association, and so on. And that those third parties are not necessarily interested in the success of the contractual relationship. Think of a city mayor that is starting a new project, that is contracting out for public services. His decision might be contested by many people outside of the, of the contract parties. So what are the consequences of this political dimension of public contract? Well, first of all, uh, third-party opportunism prevents the use of relational contracts for public-private contracts. So, so it means that public contracts are intrinsically more rigid than private ones. Also, Pablo Spiller's analysis suggests that political contestability is an issue. And so the higher the contestability, the more rigid public contracts will be. And the third consequence is that what prevails at the ex ante stage before to sign the contracts also prevails at the execution stage, meaning that public contracts are more frequently uh, re renegotiated and uh, renegotiated through formal amendments. So this view is giving an interesting alternative explanation of frequent renegotiations in public contracts. You can look at the talk about the, the issue of renegotiation. What is very interesting here is that Pablo Spiller is suggesting that public contracts should be renegotiated more frequently through formal amendment than private ones because they are more rigid at the very beginning, because they are intrinsically different compared to private contracts. In a sense, with this view, it is possible to say that the frequency of contract renegotiation in public contracts may provide a good indicator of a relational, of a relational quality. Public contracts need to be renegotiated more frequently because they are more rigid at the beginning. And you can, you can do nothing about that. This is because public contracts are intrinsically different compared to private ones. So to conclude, I would say that uh, PPPs are usually complex contracts that are bundling investment and the provision of services. PPPs has many potential advantages, but they are not a free lunch. Both parties, both contracting parties, the public side and the private side, need to invest in the relationship. And the problem is even more complex 
than for private uh, complex contracts because of intrinsic differences that are characterizing public contracts.